Hello. Today's podcast is with the Cruel Philosopher, otherwise known as Jabaya, who has two podcasts of his own. He has The Black Column with his co-host Shannon, where they discuss philosophical issues and issues surrounding modern politics and the black community and things like that. And he also has a second podcast called The Cruel Philosopher, which is sometimes a solo podcast exploring his thoughts and sometimes with other guests who he interviews and has conversations with. And today I had him on my podcast to talk about his work in music and how that affects his life as a podcaster and public thinker and philosopher. But before we get to that, please remember to like, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channel. And if you would like to consider supporting my content generally, please visit my Patreon page. Welcome to Music in Mind. Music in Mind. Hey everybody, this is uh, the Cruel Philosopher, or Jabaya, who's joining me today. He is the host of two podcasts, The Black Column, which he uh, co has his co-host Shannon, and they talk about a lot of interesting ideas, and then the Cruel Philosopher podcast, which is sometimes a solo podcast, exploring his own thoughts, and sometimes he has guests on that too. But uh, Yeah, uh, thank you for having me, number one. Um, definitely you know, excited to do this. Uh, I, I, we connected over Twitter, which yep. is dope. Is one of the only advantages of social media that I like because <laughs> yeah. other than that, you know, I think there's definitely more downsides. But linking up with different people uh, and kind of connecting in ways which uh, outside of social media, you know, there's a good chance that our paths never cross. You know, yep. Uh, so and so that was definitely one of the benefits. But um, thank you for having me. I'm excited for our conversation today. Yeah, of course. Uh, the the Twitter thing is interesting because. I, I'm really bad at Twitter. It's it's a thing that I, <laughs> some people are good at it. I I I, th I think you you're a lot better at it than I am because I see some of your comments. I, I see you come up. You actually get a little engagement. <laughs> My problem is I I use it mostly for for promotion rather mm -hmm. than e expressing thoughts, and I feel like that doesn't really work unless you're also expressing thoughts. But, see, uh, I like Twitter better than almost anything else, right? So uh -huh. it's still a bad social media platform, but it's the, it's the best out of. Like I'm not into Instagram because I don't like pictures. Like I like right. ideas and words. So mm -hmm. Twitter is natural. It has the larger, it's the largest um, user base. And I also like talking with people who I don't know. So yep. you know, Facebook. Yeah, I can talk to people, but I kind of know these individuals. I know everything about them. I kind of know how they feel about most of the topics already. Twitter yep. is much more of a uh, wild, wild west feel to it, where you know you could tweet something out, you don't know what kind of engagement is going to get. Yep. <laughs> so I, I like it, I like it much better than the other <laughs> platforms. Yeah, it's true. I also saw you on Clubhouse too. Are you still are you still active on there very much? So here's the thing about Clubhouse, right? I was a, a very active user on Clubhouse, right? So when I first got the invite to join, uh, I came on and you know I uh, felt my way around the platform, and I was not really super active. Then mm -hmm. I think maybe a week after I initially signed on, I was really active. Like I was yeah. on it every day. I was like you know staying up at these weird times in, you know, <laughs> I know. late at night. I, I, I stayed up to listen to the Elon Musk one that he did mm. uh, where he was up until like three, four in the morning. Yep. And then recently, like the past, I would say week, week and a half, I've kind of pulled back again and I haven't really been on Clubhouse in like seven to eight days. Yeah. And I wow. think that's actually going to be one of the functions of the app. I think I think Clubhouse has kind of a, um, it's like a candle that burns too quickly. Where you, it's cool because it's novelty, right? It's a new, yep. you know, technology, and so it's cool. You're talking to people, but really, I think after a couple of days or weeks, you kind of realize that um, I don't really find these many people's opinions to be all that interesting in the first place. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it could just be the rumors I, I was following because you know you, yep. you curate your own hallway, and mm -hmm. so your your hallway actually says more about you than it does the platform. So maybe that's my own fault. But uh, I just I just I, I was like, eh, you know, I would rather just get back into listening to podcast and yep. you know listening to audiobooks and things like that because i will say this it does take away from other listening uh time that you have so if you're heavy into podcasting yep. and you get hooked to clubhouse you're not going to be listening to the podcast that you were listening to because there's, there's only 24 hours in a day you can't, yep. you can't do everything yeah i i think it's interesting there i i agree with what you're saying i kind of go through waves with clubhouse um what i like about the spoken word aspect of both podcasts and clubhouse that's different than reading articles or reading Twitter is with written written medium you you have the chance to edit you can sort of think very carefully about what you're saying versus a podcast you can think something out loud and you mm -hmm. can make a mistake and you can go and shift it and I think actually that's interesting the thought process that goes into forming an idea 
I think on Clubhouse, the problem is if a room gets too big, there's too many people waiting to talk. And so everybody gets like one minute and that they just like, you know, they get their chance right there. And so that's not very interesting. Or to it's people point, who don't have very interesting ideas to begin with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but to your point, because you did bring up a good point. So first, with the, with the written word um, portion, right? Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. I, I definitely understand what you're saying where you can kind of flesh you know, your thoughts out before you tweet something or right. in, in case of Facebook, before you post something. I have absolutely seen a tweet on Twitter, got emotionally charged, was like typing out what I was, was going to say and then realized, how much do I really care about was was just tweeted and uh-huh. it just, just end up not tweeting anything because I realized yep. I don't really care that much. It bothered me, yeah, but it, I, it it didn't bother me enough to you know respond to this thing, right? right? Versus on on um, Clubhouse, uh, you have like the opposite issue where everything is is happening right now. People are fleshing out ideas right now, and you know this. Sometimes depending on the conversation that you're having, you you know you can have a conversation where you know, two people are dancing on like a dangerous line, and so yep. it you know somebody says something and then they don't have a chance to flesh it out. You get triggered, you respond. Um, <laughs> yeah. Then the whole conversation kind of just gets messed up. Uh, I think Clubhouse has a couple of issues, right? Issue number one, I think to your point, the audience dynamic, it kind of um, affects the stage dynamic in a way that I don't think people saw coming. So for example, you brought up like large rooms. Yeah. I absolutely can feel when rooms get larger, and certain conversations begin to become performative. And so people aren't really speaking how they really feel about a topic or they're being extra, you know, assertive or, or, you know, where it was, when it was a smaller room, they would have, you know, um, criticized somebody in a much more nicer way. But now that it's a big room, you know, they're a lot more harsh because they want to get those follows that, that take place after you criticize somebody harshly on stage. Yeah. Um, You got that problem. I also think it is very easy for people to kind of derail conversations on Clubhouse. So you can have a stage that's filled with just 12 people, right? It's not, it's not that big. Yeah. It's pretty much like a, a, you know, the size of your iPhone screen, 12 yeah. people. Mm-hmm. And if you let on the wrong person, they can absolutely derail the entire conversation. And it's hard once a conversation is derailed. And I've seen this multiple times. It is hard to kind of get it back on track where you want it to go, even if you yep. create the room. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. there's a whole moderating issue and stuff, and like rooms <laughs> getting taken over. Uh, the the like the scheming and the planning on Clubhouse is so ridiculous. Did you see the Brett Weinstein thing? Yep. Yeah, I was in that room. It, the girl, Brooklyn, <laughs> her, name, her name was Brooklyn. I know Brooklyn. Like, oh, you know, I, in person, not in real life. No, no, oh, no. no. Oh, oh, oh. So, like, she was one of the first people I I, I ran into on the app, right mm-hmm. before she was like, you know, this this bigger person. So when I saw the story on yeah. Twitter. I was like, is that Brooklyn? Like, my Brooklyn? <laughs> the one in there, that's Brooklyn, Brooklyn. And she absolutely has those views. Like, she wasn't performing. That's how she yeah. feels and thinks about certain things, right? But when I was listening and, and, and watching what happened, you know, Brett gets on stage and he says that he's a, you know, he's a, um, uh, 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 I think Brett he's Weinstein. what, an evolutionary biologist? Evolutionary right? biologist, something like that. I think that, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then they said, oh, so you're a eugenics, you're, you're eugenicist. Right. <laughs> She's like, no, I'm not. Right. He didn't get his point out until they like kicked him out on, kicked him off stage, and then the conversation went from an actual productive conversation into yeah. just you know no whites talking. Uh, everybody's on the stage is a person of color uh, or, yeah. or or part of you know one of the protected communities. And I yeah. think Clubhouse has that real issue, and uh, yeah. the app is not going to reach its full potential until I think um, they get it handled on it. Although you could say it is also kind of the fault of whoever's moderating. Like this yeah. is your room. That's so. true. No, no, it's true. The 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 original moderator definitely let let himself get get taken over in that case. That was uh, it. When I moderate rooms on there, for actually just just for anybody who's listening who <laughs> doesn't know about Clubhouse, because uh, not oh, everybody yeah, right. I know yeah, talks just, about yeah, Clubhouse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's a new it's a new sort of social media platform that's that's voice only, so there's no text, no video, and it's just these rooms where people can go in and talk about ideas. And then also, in theory, all that audio is gone after the the room is gone. Now I think Clubhouse does actually record everything and keep records of it internally. Yeah. So from what I heard, they record the conversation. Um, in case the room is reported, right? And so, yep. if someone mm-hmm. if someone reports the room, then they have the conversation that they can go and play back to see, you know, what happened. If if somebody violated their terms of services, and then they can reprimand that person. But then, if if no one reported the room, uh, from what I was told, 
um, whatever audio was recorded, it kind of goes in, you know into the trash bin. The yep. trash bin. Yeah. So that, that's what they're telling us. So who knows? Yeah. But uh, but yeah, the way that I like to moderate is keep a small stage of maybe six people or fewer. And basically allow people to jump in when they want. Because the problem is, if somebody has a platform for two minutes and they're going down some road that's just filled with inaccuracies or something like that, and you just have to sit with that, and then they get to the end of that, and then you sort of have to jump in at the end of that and go with this entire narrative that they've strung. It doesn't feel like a real conversation. It just feels like these weird sort of modular shifts and turns in the conversation. To your point, I have seen multiple rooms moderated differently, yeah. and I definitely think like your what you laid out is actually how I how I would do it. Now, I never started a room uh, uh-huh. because I, I I don't want to you know have the responsibility of sticking around for three four uh, hours. Yeah, <laughs> right? oh my god. And I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I also don't want to be the asshole who closes the room down when it's getting good because I have to right. go. And so I've never personally started a room, but I've def- but I, I have moderated you know in other people's rooms. To your point, um. I've seen the rooms work in a couple of different ways that are interesting. And so one way I've seen it is if you are going to have a big stage, I saw this happen and it was actually pretty, pretty interesting. So they had three moderators, right? Mm -hmm. They had the moderator who started the room. And so this was his idea or her idea. Right. And so they kind of, you know, drive the conversation. Then they had one moderator uh, that was in charge of uh, Q. And so, you know how on Clubhouse, in certain rooms, if you flash your mic on and off, it means you yep. agree or disagree? What they did is the fl- the flashing of the mic meant you wanted to be added to the queue. Mm, yeah, and so that makes sense. You didn't ha- yeah, you didn't have people, you know, interrupting the conversation, say, can I go next, can I go next, you know? And so, you couldn't respond to anybody out of term, uh, and you couldn't interject. And mm-hmm. so, uh, if you wanted to say something, you just blinked your mic, and then they added you to, to, they added you to the queue, and so when it was your time to come up, you could then respond to how many people you want or, yep. you know, or, 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 and I thought, wow, that this was a very effective way of having a large stage that didn't get into chaos because it was so orderly. Yep. Now, you brought up a good point, though, where I think depending on the topic, you don't want it to be as uh, controlled as that, right? Like, like this, there's it a certain appeal to like a back and forth yep. um, and but I don't think you can do that with a large stage. And so Mm-mm. people who want to have those back and forth, I have a, a guy following it. His name is Mando. And um, what he does is he only allows six people on stage. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, once the first six people are in there, that's it. Now, as, as people leave, he'll bring somebody else on stage. But this way, by it just being six, we can kind of just have like a, a more natural conversation, yep. disagree, go back and forth, banter without it getting chaotic. And yep. so... Uh, I definitely think with Clubhouse, the room is as good as however it is moderated. Yeah. So that is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so you're a musician too, right? Besides being yes, a podcaster. I am. So I am. I, I, Go ahead. Uh, it's just something I, I sort of picked up from listening to the podcast, but I, 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 I haven't found much of your music. I assume that the music, the intro music on your podcast is your music, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know I'm way too cheap to be paying people for something I can do myself. <laughs> I, have the, I have the same thing, man. I, uh, I I do everything myself, and sometimes it's not a good good idea, like graphic design and all that stuff. Sometimes I'm not good at delegating. I'm not good at a lot of things, but anything that I am good at that I that I can incorporate into something else that I do, I will do it. Yeah. And so uh, I'm I am a musician. I was uh, first instrument I played was probably I think um, the the Drums, probably. I think all people start off with the drums, or most uh-huh. of them start with the drums. It's just your kid, you're yep. just beating on some drums. It just looks oh, yeah. cool, right? Then my aunt Carrie, she noticed how you know how much I like music, and so she brought me a tambourine, right? Um, now, for context, people, I, I grew up in church, you know, the black church, a lot mm-hmm. of singing, a lot of you know music that goes in the, in the black church. So most of my family went to that church as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, my immediate family and my extended family. And so my aunt Carrie, um, she brought me the tambourine, and then she also brought me a, a bongo set as well. Uh, when I got a little bit older, right? Um, then uh, my my parents had a keyboard in the house that my older brother used to play, hmm. um, but he's not as much of a, as much of a, a musician as I am now. But uh-huh. he was like the first one in the family that was playing the keyboard. Uh, even though we come from a family of musicians, like I have uncles who you know who used to play you know keyboard and organ. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I picked up the the piano that way. Uh, can't read music, and so I, I play oh, by wow. ear. 
Yeah, so I even I, still, I, you know, even still, and I went to wow. music school. I went to music. Now here's the thing: I could I could learn enough. I could read a treble clef uh-huh. because when I went to high school for music, uh, I, I picked up the violin, and so for that you kind of have to yeah. you know read read mm-hmm. music. So I could do that, though I was never good enough to be like. Uh, my my teachers where you could put like a, a, a fresh sheet of music in front of them and they uh-huh. just go. <laughs> I was right. like, I could never do that. Um so learn the keyboard, you know, play that for a long time and then uh uh I, I wanted to be like an R B singer growing up. Mm-hmm. So so uh I used to sing to this girl, her name was Natasha. I remember <laughs> junior high school Natasha, <laughs> she was gorgeous, man. Like nice. I was upset. I don't remember anything. <laughs> Here's what crazy uh what's crazy, um do you use your name on this podcast? Yeah. Okay, so this is crazy, uh, Anthony. I don't remember anything I learned in the school, uh-huh. but I remember all the girls that I had a crush on. All I, I heard <laughs> name them off one by Whoa. one, which nice. grade, you know, um, how they made me feel, you know, whether I went out with them, like, I, vividly, because I was just obsessed <laughs> with, with girls I, nice. as a young man. And so Natasha was, you know, in my eyes, the, the most beautiful girl in the school, as most of the guys thought, and I noticed that she liked Guys who could sing, and uh-huh. so I started to sing, like you know, and sing, sing. Yeah. Uh, and I, a couple of people say, "Wow, you know, you're really good at, at this thing." I'm like, "Really?" Because I used to sing in the church choir, but it's mm-hmm. totally different than singing R and B music. And I remember yeah. the first song that I sang to her was just a friend by Mario. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. "I want to know your name, man. I want to know if you got it, man. I want to <laughs> know." Right. So that was my song, and then from there, uh, puberty hit me, mm-hmm. and so <laughs> my range went from, you know. Tenor to yeah, you know, like the, right, it, yeah. It, it, and so I could no longer sing sing the songs I used to be able to sing. <laughs> so mm. I kind of leaned more into the piano part of, part part of it. Right, right. Uh, as I got older, um, my family told me that I didn't have to go to church anymore. Right, so mm-hmm. going to church was not a a choice uh, as a child. But once I became of age, you know, like uh, seventeen, eighteen, mm-hmm. they said, "Hey, well, we're not going to force you to go to church. You can go if you want to." Uh, so I stopped mm-hmm. going, of course, as most young right. young men do. Then um, I got a call from my aunt, uh, who's a preacher, and her husband is a preacher as well. That oh, they, wow. needed a, they needed a musician, uh, and I was like, "Well, I'll go, but I don't, I don't, I don't play gospel music, right?" Uh-huh. And I always l- wanted to, though. I would see the organ player at my church, and he was amazing. You know, the organ you have the the two the two keys on top, and then you have the the bass that you play. Oh yeah, the, the pedals. Yeah, yeah. And so it always looked too complicated, but I wanted to learn it so bad. So um, when I started playing for uh, their church, I started on a motif, a small motif. Then was mm-hmm. for sixty one keys, small motif, mm-hmm. uh, Yamaha that I was playing on, right? Um, and then I think maybe a year, two years later, I jumped on the big boy organ, started playing that. And so right now I'm a church organist, and that's kind of the predominant music that I do now is gospel. Uh-huh. Are you so playing on an actual like a, a a pipe organ or a oh, electronic no, no. It, organ? It, so, it's not so it's neither it's called a, a it's a leslie organ and oh, so okay yeah 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 cool. so I, I play a leslie organ um and i i love it man like a, a gospel music i love it it yeah it's beautiful it's, uh, <laughs> that man <laughs> that it. that that organ sound it's like it's one of my favorite things like in rock music especially mm-hmm. when that gets added it's just it's so emotive it has that motion in it oh man well that's the best part for me is that with an organ you, like the, the organ can, can sound like many instruments, even though yep. they all sound like the organ, because you know the draw boards that you have, mm-hmm. uh, you know that that you, you just change the tone of the sound that you that you have going on, um, and then there's so many styles of playing as well. And so like right now, um, I'm, I'm kind of stuck because I, I haven't mastered playing you know chords with my left and the bass line with my foot uh, and a different set of chords with my right hand. <laughs> I'm kind of stuck as a keyboardist where. You know, when you first learn keyboard, most people learn it bass line with your left hand, chords with your right hand, and mm-hmm. that's kind of the, right. how most R and B music is made. And then, and then as you get older, you kind of transition to okay, well, use my left hand to play, uh, you know, certain chords or part of a chord, and then I combine it with my right hand, and then you can have like some really beautiful stuff um, in your music. Uh, so I'm trying to mm-hmm. learn left hand chords right now, but boy, it's a pain. Uh oh, we still here, Anthony? I think I think we're frozen. Can you hear me? Anthony, we back. Yeah, I can. Okay. There we go. <laughs> oh my right. god, I'm so sorry. You, no, see, it's okay. You, you guys have experienced what happens when me and Shannon do our, uh, <laughs> our God podcast. It's all right. <laughs> it, it happens. Did you keep recording audio? Yeah, I didn't stop. Okay, I cool. figured it would come back once you know once the internet picked up. 
It's a bummer. That was so good. I was enjoying what you were saying, and then it was I know, like I know. glitching out. <laughs> I forgot what I was saying last too. Before, uh, what's the last thing you heard? Uh, you were talking about chords and playing the bass line, and then R and B, and yeah. yeah. And so uh, yeah, you know, it's just like right now. I'm just trying to learn to do the chords with the left hand because once I learn that, it'll really kind of open up, you know, the the number of songs that I can learn, and also uh -huh. just how much you can do with the organ. So I'm very excited about, about that. Yeah. So do you read lead sheets even? Like a melody no, with chord I, structures or anything? Like I, that? I don't read anything. I, wow. it, the way I learn songs, I play them. Mm -hmm. I, I, I play the, the record. I listen to it, and then I I, I listen to the um, the chords, uh -huh. uh, and then I that's how I learn all my gospel songs. Wow! And so, like even chord names and stuff, something like an E minor nine or something like that. So I I know the names of the chords, like E minor, C major. You know, uh, uh, right. You know, I know my keys. I know my chords. Um, but but, but I, I I can't read music. And if you if you said to me, hey, we're gonna you know we're gonna go on um you know one five one or no one one five four <laughs> yeah I would look at you like I don't know what you're talking about wow okay <laughs> so all right all I all I'll do is listen to you and then uh -huh. pick up on the pattern and then okay okay that's how I think of music to me it's, it's all just patterns yep you know Definitely. you know um if you listen to a lot of records for example R and B is it, it, there's a lot of patterns to most most of the music that that is made today. Uh, mm -hmm. Gospel songs the same way. There's like certain patterns in songs, and so um, you kind of get really good at, at predicting songs based off of all the songs you learned in the past. So when you learn like ten gospel songs, you kind of learn half of them. Right. Yeah. And so that's kind of that what sense. I do. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's it's interesting because I it's, it's a fight I have with some of my students because a lot of guitar students really really resist both learning how to read music and learning theory as in names of things and like we were saying one five one stuff like that mm -hmm. and some of some of the the stronger students will will just flat out say why do i need to know this and um i, I, I don't have a good answer uh i do i, I, I do if you are out there in, in uh in his class right now to all of your students uh who, who watch this <laughs> learning how to read music learning music theory will will change your life in a couple of ways number one um, if you're looking to be an employ an, an uh, employable musician, yep. Like being able to read something and then play it on the spot gives you it's access huge. to a lot more jobs mm -hmm. than it does if you can only play by ear, right? Um, and so I I'm fortunate because I play gospel uh, in churches, and so for a lot of them, they just want to know if you know how to play. Uh, can you pick up? Yep. on people when they start singing mm -hmm. and so it actually leads itself to being more ear friendly but if you're trying to go out there and, and you want to play you know for broadway or you want to you know um, yep. um play for for uh, uh you know just you know get hired to to play background for an artist you have to read music yep. and so even if you play by ear it doesn't it, it doesn't hurt um learning how to read and music theory and learning while you're younger is way better than waiting until you're older because your oh, yeah. mind is still a sponge and so yep. i would tell all of them yeah don't be like me when I, I said the same. I'm like, I don't need to learn this stuff. But if I could go back, I would definitely learn how to read music. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it allows you to communicate easily and quickly with other musicians too. But if your ear is good enough, th this is this is the caveat I have with all of them. It's if your ear is good enough and you are not looking to be employed in session work or pit orchestra work or things like that. It is possible to get by. Like there's been some famous jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. who don't really know a lot of theory and don't know how to read music. But if your ear is good enough and you're able to intuit sort of the rules, so to speak, mm -hmm. patterns, you, you can do it. Yeah, I think it's to, harder, but, but yeah. But, yeah but, but to your point also, you have to remember the genre as well. So yep. jazz, like, you know, in and of itself is an improv, yep. you know, genre of music. And mm -hmm. so uh, versus if, if you want to do classical, it, it is not, you know... It, an improv style of music, you have to know how the song goes. Right. And think about certain classical pieces, unlike gospel, jazz, R and B. You know, depending on who your composer is, it is a lot harder to predict you know, right. <laughs> what, what yeah, is going yeah. to happen next. It can be impossible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so you could be starting out thinking, okay, it's going to go like this, and then you get to kind of like the, the second movement of a piece, and it sounds totally different. Yeah. So you will have to read music to be an effective musician. Um. But 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 one thing I will say is. It is a lot harder for certain people because for me, when I play music, it is very hard for me to be disciplined. Uh, and when mm. I say discipline, I mean as far as uh, I get lost in music because right. I, I love playing it so much, right? So 
you know, when you're as a church musician, I'm usually playing for choirs or, or mm -hmm. people singing solos. And and the hardest part for me is staying aware of what's going on, because when I play it, it's just like my mind just goes into like this other place uh, where I'm, I'm no longer like attached to this world. And right. so uh, but that has its downsides because I enjoy playing in groups. Uh -huh. You know, I enjoy playing with people, and you know, in order to do that, you kind of have to be aware of, hey, you know, we're all playing this part together. You know, it's, it's his time to shine, not my time. I'm in the background right now. I'm auxiliary keys. He's the main keys. You know, so, mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. It, I mean, it, it brings up an interesting idea. It's something I think about that I, I don't really understand why why more musicians don't don't appreciate this. But I think that being a musician is this. It's a unique um, negotiation between individualism and collectivism, mm. in a way. And I, like I noticed, like when I listen to your podcast, some of your political views, you definitely have a sense of personal responsibility. Or I get, I get the sense that you feel like that's important, mm -hmm. and also communal responsibility, um, which to me is what being a musician in a group is. You need to be absolutely personally responsible for yourself because. Y you are responsible for your part and you have to be good enough to be able to do that whether it's by ear whether it's you've practiced enough or whatever but that is ultimately you being that good and as best you can be will serve the group as a whole so it's sort of individualism and collectivism collap collapsing into themselves or i don't know about collectivism but community at least do you think um kind of how you feel about that depends on how you start it. Meaning, for example, mm -hmm. if you if you were introduced to um, introduced to music uh, as like a solo singer, uh -huh. uh, do you think it'll be harder for you to kind of see that uh, the your point about it being like a a collective experience right. versus if you're somebody who grew up in a church choir? Yeah, so it's kind of your background already. Yep, I mean, Cause, solo singers, I feel like <laughs> singers have the have the biggest problems. <laughs> I don't know. We don't. I don't even know if they're musicians, to be honest. But that is an interesting point. And here's the thing: I might saw it. Ben Shapiro did a podcast where he was talking to the rapper named Zuby, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, and, yeah. Zuby's great. Okay, so did, did you see the part where Ben he said he doesn't consider rap to be music? Uh. Uh. Yeah, I did. I did. I did. So it started trending, and I was like, "What is Ben talking about?" But when I heard him explain, I started thinking back, and I was like, "Because." I'm such a fan of hip hop. My right. my knee jerk reaction was kind of what, but then <laughs> yeah, when he explained, you, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when he explained what he was talking about, was like you know, the, you know, we're, we're rapping, is, you know, there's no melody. Um, right. you know, like these guys aren't trained. Um, I, I was thinking, I was like, maybe black people did create something that was just different. Yeah, but we didn't have a category for it, so we just put it in the music genre. But maybe it's it, it like should we should we view hip hop as Another genre of music, or should we look at should we look at hip hop as the evolution of you know poetry? Right. You know, and so when he made his point, I thought it was a very interesting point about you know musicianship, and you know, and so when you said our singers musicians, I don't think they are. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think they are. I, I hope all my singer friends are listening to this. It's this great. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean we hate singers right. or or like. I, I, I was in the church choir. I was in my right. choir when I went to high school. Uh, I love choirs, but uh, uh, I do think we, we should draw a line in the sand when we talk about musicianship, right. because I do think it is something different. Mm. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I, I don't know. I guess I, I go back and forth on it. I, I've never really taken the argument that rap isn't music very seriously, mm -hmm. um, because I don't think that melody necessarily is a requirement for music to me music okay. and dance are sort of intrinsically related and it has to do with sort of embodiment of of gesture or feeling or something like that and with music you translate that through an instrument or through your voice and with dance you're just moving your hands so if you can move your hand and make a sound come out of the keyboard that's a gesture and if you're if you're really feeling the rhythm, you have to dance, and it's a thing that like I, I have a couple of young drum students, and I try and get them to feel that bounce because it's really hard to keep a beat if you're just really stiff and trying to hit every click of the metronome. But if you feel the groove and you're actually dancing with it, then you're playing. Um, That's an interesting point. I, ne I never thought about it that way. Um, I, I because dance and music 
they look like they belong together. Right. Uh, because oftentimes, you know, people usually don't dance without music. Uh, right. And to your point about musicians, it, it, you know, it, it, especially we, it, outside of classical, when we're talking about anything with like a, a rhythm or a beat, you, you usually the musicians themselves are moving. You know, they're right. like, you know, like moving towards the beat. Like, you know, Ray Charles, if you look at old clips of Ray Charles, he's like, he can't stop. Oh, yeah. He's just, yep. you know, he just, <laughs> Stevie Wonder, he just, yep, yep. he can't stop moving mm -hmm. uh, because it, it kind of just uh, demands it almost of you uh, yep. to move, uh, to, to really get into this music. So I would say I agree, I, uh, agree with your point. And I wasn't agreeing with Ben Shapiro's point right. about rap not being music. I was just saying he was the first person to lay out an argument yep. that I thought couldn't be dismissed immediately like yeah. i had to think about what he was saying it's like oh you know because to me i think it's also an extension to i love hip-hop music but i think the worst performers in music it's not even close are hip-hop artists <laughs> yeah it, i've seen a lot of bad me. performances <laughs> it's awful yeah. it, it, because to, to ben's point they don't sing so they're not they're not learning a melody uh they don't really dance right yeah. and so the thing that makes you a great hip-hop artist is like studio skills right. studio performance yep, yep. Versus performing live is a different set of skills that most hip hop artists don't really think about, and so all they end up doing is shouting into the microphone, jumping around on stage yeah. uh, with like a hype man, and that's not really entertaining yeah. for like an hour and a half. No, the worst is when they rap over the the track of them. Oh rapping. my god! Yeah, <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Why are you even performing? <laughs> Where's your instrumental trap? <laughs> exactly, <Why? laughs> and did that a lot. Yeah, I think it's like part of the culture almost. Like it's kind yeah. of expected. I think it's also because I don't know if you've tried rapping before, Anthony, but no. uh, if you ever do, I will say uh -huh. this: rapping requires a lot of breath control. I bet. And yeah, yeah. I think maybe the reason why they, they they rap on top of their own record is because they don't know when they're gonna need a breather, and so they don't want that death spot in there. Right, right. And yep. so they, they'll just stop rapping and have themselves rapping in the background, and then right. come in later on in the song. But that's what uh, practice is for. No, nah, I'm with you. I've been all lazy. But <laughs> like, you know, I'm just what if I did? I have a gig. I'm playing. And, like I have my track <laughs> just in case. Random question, Anthony. You ever got a, a bad cramp in your uh, in your hand when you was playing? No, I did have to take off uh, in college when I when I was studying music uh, in undergrad. I had to take off about a month because I was sort of over practicing and I injured my wrist and I couldn't play for a while. Uh, carpal, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome? I, th I, th I think so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had that happen to me one time um, where I was playing on the keyboard and I don't know, my my hands got like stuck in like a position Whoa. where I had to, where I, I had to like, yeah, it, it was like naturally one in the clothes. And so I was like, what is going on? Uh, I still know what happened that day. Um, it, it was wild. My friend Julian, he's a cook. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that happened to him from time to time. As well, I think maybe people who kind of have that, who, who do this for a long time and over and over again. Yeah. Um, and I also know for a fact that I, I don't play the right way as far as, uh, you know, keeping your wrist a certain, you know, yeah. a certain level. Yeah. I, I play Southern Black uh, <laughs> or, you know, August style where I, I, I rest my hand on the, the edge of the. the uh, Whoa. Okay. The, so the, you have the, like the, a really the, extended wrist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I'm trying to change it. So I'm not, yeah. I'm not promoting bad practicing. <laughs> I'm trying to change this. I'm trying to change this. But yeah. like I said, it's kind of how I just, you know, went into this thing naturally. Uh, one thing I wanted to say before we move on about the, the hip hop artist. Mm -hmm. Best, best hip hop performer I've seen is Kanye West. And it's not even close. Oh, wow. I, okay. I feel like he was one who really tried to put on an actual performance, mm -hmm. right? And so, if you ever been to a Kanye West concert or, or, or seen him, he uh, he'll have like a lot of artwork in the back, or he'll he'll uh, you know he he designs his stages really well. He has dancers that that he'll use, um, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so he really went out of his way to say, "Hey, I'm not just going to be on stage, you know, jumping." Even that that time he was at Coachella, Coachella, and he had an entire orchestra behind him. Yep. And they had like that the red bands on their eyes. It was a simple thing to think about, but it mm -hmm. made the performance that much better yep. because you had this movement behind them. And I just wish rappers would put as you know as much effort into their performances as he does because I do think it would just make for a much better you know performing experience. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I have a I have a friend who toured with him. Uh, she was one of his violinists in in Australia at one point. But oh, yeah, wow. I mean, she talks about that. It was just like the the choreography, the costuming. It was a really visually stunning experience. I think it's a problem. That's not just a rap problem. I think uh, I've noticed it a lot in universities. Um, 
actually, I think I talk, I've talked about this a couple times on, on the podcast now, but I think that academic musicians specifically resist the idea that they're putting on a show and they don't want to be entertainers. They, they feel like the music should speak for itself. But to me, it's losing a huge dynamic or a huge uh, dimension of, of what entertainment is or what a performance is. I so understand where they're coming from, though, because yeah. I, I like, for example, I hate, I hate, um, video. Uh huh. Oh yeah, right? you so, talked about this too. You don't like putting it. it out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, for me, cruel philosophy. I, yeah. yeah, I would much prefer kind of just doing my podcast, you know, in my room. Yeah. You know, no video and just putting audio out. But I feel like it's much easier to prom- to promote something attached to to video. Yep. And so I'm kind of forced to do the video thing, even though I hate it. Uh, yep. And so kind of just related to their point, I can see how if you are a musician and your gift is making music, and so you make music, or even if your gift is just performing. like So mm-hmm. you have musicians that create music, you have musicians that just perform music that was, was created by other people. Uh, I can understand not wanting to put all this extra work in performing because you don't find that part of the quote unquote job enjoyable. Right. Right. But what I would tell people is that is okay, that's fine, but don't put on performances then. Yep. Right. Like it's mm-hmm. fine just yep. just creating stuff. It's also fine if you just want to perform other people's stuff and uh it's kind of known that hey, you know, would like you ever seen a, a quartet perform live? Mm-hmm. Like a string yeah, quartet? Just, you know, yeah, string quartet. Yeah. It's just mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, two violinists, a viola, and a cello, and right. they're usually sitting in four of them. There's not much going on, but we all know going into this thing this, that we're here for the music. We're not here to, to see this, you know, viola player do a backflip. <laughs> Smash <laughs> so we're here. the viola. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're here. We're here because of the um, the performance, and yeah. we, you know, we want to enjoy it, mm-hmm. right? Um, but then. Don't call yourself a performer. If you're going to call yourself a performer, uh, outside of like a classical context, especially, right. then yeah, all that other stuff matters. It matters, you know, um, how engaged you are with the crowd. It matters, you know, if how much you move during the record, yeah. it, it, costumes, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, color design, light design, all of those things mm-hmm. matter. Yep. Um, and so yeah, I get hitting, hitting it, but I would tell them uh, if you're going to perform, then. You, Put on an actual performance. Give people what they paid for, right. especially you know if you hope that they're going to come back in the future. Right. Yeah. I mean, you you must see it work, working in, in in church too. I mean, the 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 sermon that's a performance. See, they don't want to. They would never say that. But yes, I, I agree. I think the uh-huh. um the the uh uh the thing with 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 gospel, uh, especially in church, uh-huh. is. That uh, uh, especially black churches, you know, Baptist, you know, uh, Pentecostal, mm-hmm. uh, we just just kind of within the culture, we are a a a very um, demonstrative people. So uh-huh. when we, when we're in church singing and uh, uh, it's a given that we're gonna dance. It's a given that uh, um, it's gonna be a very lively experience, yeah. uh, right? Like um, even someone like me, I, I don't do a bunch of moving and shouting and all of that. I pretty much, I'm, I'm playing, I'm a musician, I'm on the organ, I, I, I was play. But even where I'm at, I've definitely seen a change where I, you know, I have my occasional, you know, organ solo that I'll do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'll lead a song from time to time. Um, and uh, I become a different person almost right. when I'm doing those things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with what you're saying about, you know, uh, performing as a skill is it, it's very important. And it's, it's so unfortunate that it seems to be kind of a dying art amongst young yep. musicians. Yeah. Or maybe maybe we're just getting too old and we don't understand it. It's I, I do have this worry that like I TikTok is is beyond <laughs> me. I, I I don't like it. I don't get it. I feel like I'm I'm becoming a grumpy old man or something. Mm. And I feel like I really, really don't understand the culture of like sixteen year olds. But I don't either. Uh, I also don't <laughs> understand why these things are deemed funny. I remember one day yes, I Yes, yes. I wanted to go through a bunch of them to see, okay, well, let me get the, because, look, I'm not going to front, like, I, I didn't try to do certain things, right? So, I tried to do, like, Instagram stuff mm-hmm. before because that, that was kind of what everyone was doing. And right. I realized I don't have whatever talent I need. I cannot condense what I have to say within 60 seconds. Right. And, and, and it'd be good enough 
that people will want to come back to listen to what I have to say tomorrow. And so that wasn't my skill. Mm-hmm. TikTok, it seems to be even less time. It was like 30 seconds, you know, 25 right. seconds. And it, it, some of them, they, they do do some very interesting things with their TikTok. Do you remember the one where, uh, uh, man, it was like a challenge. I think it, it involved like ping pong balls or something. And <laughs> they were like hitting it uh, like with a paddle. Okay. Um, and it, it will always go in. And then somebody sh- showed the trick. It was like two people, one person that was at a different angle. And so you oh, would hit the yeah. ping pong. It would go off, off, off the phone or at some weird yeah. angle. And then somebody behind it would just drop one right into the cup. And I was like, wow, that's a ge- I would, would never thought of that. It's genius. <laughs> I mean, it's cool. So, They're like learning to be directors. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so to your point about um, us getting gold, I do think that is a thing where – uh, technology moves so fast that even yep. though we're not old, right, right. we are old in like technological years, probably. Yep. Yeah, I think so. Like I, I had a flash drive for school. Yeah. Right. These kids know what a flash drive is. I had a floppy disk. Yep. Yeah. yeah when I was a kid, is? man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Play games on them, and you have to. <laughs> yeah. You'd have a whole box. A game would be like ten discs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know what that is. So yeah. <laughs> we're old, man. Yep. So, um, so do you feel like music informs your your worldview at all, or your your philosophy work, or having anything mm. to do with with your podcasting? Because I think my my uh, my training as a musician has taught me how to think, uh, specifically slow practice that that very focused, very repetitive, very careful attention to detail that's required to learn music. I think has helped me be a better thinker overall this is going to be hard for me to 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 think about because i knowing what we was going to discuss on this podcast i was just thinking about this question already and Mm -hmm. it's hard for me to find a correlation because i think i'm kind of the same way in everything so you know like when i do my show with shannon the black column like you know one of the things that we'll do is whenever we have like a very very uh uh politically incorrect Uh moment for myself you know shannon (laughs) shannon likes to say well look that's him. That ain't me. Right. You know, that, 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 that's him. Right. And I try to be as raw as possible. Yep. Um, and as honest as possible whenever I do my podcasting. And I think with music, it's the same way for me yep. where I try to be as, you know, close to who I am in everything and everything that I do. So even as a church musician where I'm playing records and songs that were written by other people, when I have them, I like to make them my own thing. Mm hmm. Right. In, in, in a way where it kind of has my stamp of 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 of, of inspiration, uh, you know, on it right. um, as I'm performing these these songs for other people. And so maybe that's the correlation where it's kind of just uh, anything that, that comes from me. I want people to know, oh, this came from him. Right. Mm-hmm. So but other than that, I, I can't see any other you know correlations. Well, the 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 want the wanting to be as sort of honest about yourself as possible is is an interesting desire. I I have the same thing, and I I feel it more and more as I feel like society is getting more and more closed down and mm-hmm. restrictive about the number of questions you can ask, the types of questions you can ask. I want more and more to be just completely honest, and that's something that I I love about the black column is you just go into things and you just say an idea that you have unapologetically and um yeah i think i think it's important it's it's harder to know if you're doing that in music but i think you can feel if you're being dishonest or you're being honest it's something i so i, I used to play in broadway shows a lot and i was getting really sick of it because it, it i mean it, <laughs> it's like play a reggae tune play a calypso <laughs> tune play a rock tune play r&b mm-hmm. and it's all like it's like bullshit versions of all of these kinds of music. Yeah, I, I think um, m- maybe uh, with music, the, the way that I'm, you know, myself, to your point is, is I try to stay away from structured things. So like, you know, mm-hmm. Broadway is very structured. Um, you know, classical music is, yep. uh, is, is, is structured, you know. And so I'm, I'm naturally attracted to genres of music that, that kind of allows the performer to mm-hmm. to uh, be more creative, and so you know, gospel and R and B are my two favorite genres. You know, of, of music It's not even close. Um, you know, as far as the podcast, the Black Column, uh, we couldn't do that show any other way because I think people lie too much already. 
There was a book that I read. It was called Everybody Lies, and it was mm-hmm. written by this this guy. And the premise of the book is that uh, he basically goes and uses Google, you know, the search engine that we all use, and he goes through the, you know, the data footprints, and he kind of sees, you know, certain patterns that don't seem to match what we have been led to believe. So just a quick example. Right. Um, how, you know, the, the Bible Belt, who who's, you know, they're very restrictive about uh, um, you know, sexuality and, you know, things of that nature, but they consume the most porn. Right. And not only do they consume the most porn, they consume, like, the most extreme type of porn oh, yeah. like that, mm-hmm. right? And so, clearly, clearly, these people who live in this Bible Belt, they're a living contradiction. As they're preaching one thing to everybody else, what they're doing behind closed doors is yep. watching the same freaky porn and stuff that they're yep. telling other people not to engage in. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of feel that way about almost everybody. I think everyone is lying. I think everyone is kind of full of something uh, because, and I get it, we've made kind of the cost of telling the truth to be a, a very costly venture. Yep. Mm-hmm. I just am not going to stop paying the toll. Good. <laughs> yeah, that's that's, that's that, just me. Yeah, man, that's that that's great. I think I think also there are benefits to it. I think we see it in some of the these rising stars and sort of the the intellectual dark web movement mm-hmm. is is people who go through the fire with their head up and come out the other side better for it. Well, lying just does something to you that people don't realize, which is when you lie all the time, eventually at some point you're going to begin to question, are you lying to yourself? Right. Right. It's, it's, it's almost inevitable. And so we've we've been conditioned, actually, in this culture to lie. From the time yep. that, that we're young, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and maybe, maybe for good reasons, right? So a quick a quick example is, um, uh, let's say if somebody asks me, hey, uh, you know, how's your day? I'm, I'm having an awful day. And I say, oh, you know, everything is good. I'm, I'm fine. Yep. yep. I just lied. Now, yep. I lied because I didn't want to burden that person with how my actual day is going. And truthfully, and, and truthfully speaking, he probably doesn't care how it's going. He's been taught by society to ask how you're doing because that's kind of what we consider to be good manners. Right. But he really doesn't care either. Mm-hmm. And so we pick up on these little these things and, and you know, there's the small lies and there's the, the, the big lies that we tell. And we, we kind of been conditioned to think that lying is not that big of a deal. But for me, it is because if everyone's out here lying, then we can't really solve certain problems that need to be solved. And the only way to solve them is by having these difficult conversations um, that we have honestly yeah. in good faith so we can actually reach solutions. But people thrive on the lack of solution-oriented conversations mm-hmm. because for some individuals, their 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 uh, income depends on the constant bickering back and forth. It yeah. doesn't depend on there ever being an actual resolution so yeah i think it's the the in good faith is is really the key to it because i mean i can tell from listening to you i mean the 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 what was i just i was listening to the one where you and shannon were talking about the sh- shooting in in ohio the the girl who was oh, stabbing M- M- makai brian yeah yeah exactly mm-hmm. and um it was obviously neither one of you is looking for people to get killed or for situations to get worse in these communities, you're honestly exploring ideas in good faith. Mm-hmm. And you also have a relationship with each other where you believe that each other doesn't want things to get worse. And so you're not furious with each other because you have different opinions. And you're able to maintain that relationship because you sort of have trust and love for each other or something like that. Yeah, I think it's kind of because we kind of agree that me and her both want, uh, you know, uh, the, the black community to be better off. Of course, uh, right. We, we we know that we agree on that one point, and so anything else that we say, we know that we know to look at it through the lens of we want the black community to be uh, in a, in a good place. Because if anyone who listens to the show, me and her agree on like a lot, right? Like uh, I mean, we disagree on a lot. Um, I think even the the, <laughs> yeah. the Makai Bryan shooting, I was like, I, th- I think I said verbatim. I think I said this that uh. <laughs> um, it's unfortunate that she got shot. Mm-hmm. That said, if you can't shoot her, who can you shoot? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> like a funny this. way of phrasing a question. <laughs> yeah, like, like, <laughs> but yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, like this, if you can't shoot this person in this scenario, then who can police shoot? Because to me, right. I, I thought, I thought, okay, this is kind of you know shut close case. I was stunned at the 
the conversation that came after this where people were like pretending like this guy was Derek Chauvin. I'm like, right? How are we gonna pretend like this is the same cop as Derek Derek Chauvin? It, to me, that's dishonest. Yep. And so I, I think because me and her kind of believe that we both uh, have good intentions for our, our people, of course. it allows us to, to, to be as honest as possible um, and, and assume the best in each other's argument. And so we don't assume that somebody is trying to make somebody look bad or yep. somebody is trying to get somebody to, to, to say some, something on the podcast that will get them canceled, you know, two, three uh, years right, later. Right, right, right. Um, and I think it's just a much more healthy place to be. Yeah, I I agree. Um, it feels, it, I mean, it feels good. It feels free. You're not scared. You're not hiding from things. Like I, I put out an album last year about that idea of hiding. Cause I feel like everybody's hiding sort of mm-hmm. similar to everybody's lying. And I, I don't even know what we're hiding from ourselves and each other. Cause we've created this, this toxic world. Where we're all at each other's throats. Well, the hiding part is interesting because to a certain degree, we all hide in, in, a, in I understand why, right? So, for uh-huh. example, take me, take me, right? Where I, I'm currently going through some some health issues, right? Both mm-hmm. physical and um, mental, right? Uh, and I mean, it's brutal, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, okay. Like, just trying to deal with 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 the uh, especially the mental stuff is very mm-hmm. very brutal for me, right? And yesterday was the first time I told my parents about what was going on, and mm-hmm. it was a very emotional time for me because. I never lied to them. I just didn't tell them right. these things because right. I didn't see any benefit to tell these people about what was going on with me, you know, physically, you know, mentally, uh-huh. et cetera, et cetera. Only reason why I actually cracked was because it got so bad and scary for me. It just kind of came out. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and so I understand the the urge to hide right. um, because, you know, kind of the flip side to dealing with people who are honest actors is is you don't want to reveal the most vulnerable parts to yourself to people who may not have your best interest at yep. heart. Yeah, and, of course. You know, I, I think there's a popular saying that says, you know, um, uh, yesterday's friends make uh, today's worst enemies or something like that, which is mm-hmm. which is pretty much that people who know all this information about you right, right. Uh, can use it against you in the future. Mm-hmm. And you kind of have to be very mindful and hesitant of that. Uh, and so be careful how you move. And so... I understand people hiding. I understand people, people uh, keeping things to yourself. Right. But I do think kind of after me cracking yesterday, if I had kind of told my parents what I was going through earlier uh, or, or even took the steps to reach out to a mental right. health professional right. earlier, I would have been served better than, uh-huh. you know, right. hiding and trying to deal with this thing on my own. So I get the urge, but I do think it is counterproductive. It, it's hard, man. Fear is just. The, the the fear of being vulnerable like that is it's so real it, it's weird I I think there's a similar principle in uh, like battle going into uh, like a war zone or something uh, a, an army has to keep moving forward if you sit and you hide in the same spot you're definitely gonna die so even though you're vulnerable by going forward that is the safest thing you can do yeah exposing it, 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 yourself and keep moving that's a great point because if if you're just hiding uh, and this one spot, you know, you're not moving because you're, you're afraid to move towards the the, en- the enemy combatants. Right. You're leaving yourself open to, you know, somebody spotting you from above, you mm-hmm. know, dropping bombs on you. And so to your point, um, you kind of have to eventually at some point sooner than later, keep the troops moving, yep. um, even if it is even if it is towards enemy fire. Yep. Yeah. yeah it, it, Sorry. No, I, I just want to just wrap up and say, but, but I, I get that that is easier said than done oh, because we are human. Kind of tackling that fear, getting mm-hmm. over that fear, it's a lot easier to say it, uh, but actually doing it and then kind of forcing yourself through, boy, it takes a lot of, you know, of, of heart to do that. Yeah. Well, it's humbling because you have to face that you are afraid and you have to say, I'm afraid. It's, uh, it, I don't know, it, 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 obviously in music, <laughs> you're not going to get shot. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. but like playing in a pit orchestra if i mess up badly i've found the best thing i can do is look directly up at the conductor like i need help even mm. though that i mean it's, it's embarrassing i could get fired but the best thing for me to do is figure out how to get out of that situation i'm in and so i <laughs> so Not i bad. need to have i need to have the humility to to be like yeah i fucked up uh please help that's kind of a great point um, 
you know, because either, especially when you're playing with like, you know, in, in an orchestra or right. a band, yep. uh, you have the, condu- the conductor who's there, you know, they're usually keeping um, tempo yep. while also uh, you know, directing which parts, you know, to come in mm-hmm. at one point, you know, um, crescendo or, you yep. know, yep. whatever, you know, just just different, you know, musical accents to a piece. Uh, but but you, you're you expected to kind of know how the song goes on your own, especially right. by the time mm-hmm. you get to a performance. Yep. And so to your point about being embarrassed or even afraid to, hey, uh, I'm kind of offbeat here. That said, though, here's the thing. Would you rather not ask the conductor for assistance because you're afraid of, you know, potentially getting fired or try to find your way back during this performance where you're playing all the wrong notes at all the wrong time, (laughs) messing up the entire performance? Asking the conductor what to do is a way better solution than trying to figure it out on your own. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep, but it's that it's that humility uh, of being able to mm-hmm. face it, and it's scary. And he might be mad at you. Yeah, you might get fired. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but here's the thing: you might get fired if you ask for help. You definitely don't get fired if oh, you're yeah. like playing all the wrong notes during the performance. So even practically, it's much better uh, to ask the conductor. But to your point uh, about kind of getting over that fear and humbling yourself enough to kind of. Um, you know, take the appropriate action. It's not easy, and so I, I don't want people to think that I'm 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 acting like it is easy because I know it's not easy. It, right. it, it's, it's not easy to to do these things. But my thinking is, if you don't do them sooner than later, you you're going to push things off till you have no choice but to seek help. Yep. And then now, instead of dealing with this little bit of help that you needed, now you now you're dealing with a lot of help that you need. Uh, and so it, 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 like you were better off dealing with this right. earlier. Yep. So, but it's hard. <laughs> yeah, man, it is. But life is hard, you know. Like, like well, life sucks. Uh, you know, I think I, <laughs> yeah. I, I had a. I don't know if I tweeted this or I think I tweeted this. I said, uh, it's, it's kind of wild that you know people have kids just because they want them, mm-hmm. right? Like the fact that we have that power to bring a whole new person to experience this bullshit just because we want them here. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Like <laughs> their life could be filled with misery and pain, mm-hmm. and we're we're gonna bring them into this stuff just off of our whims. It's right. kind of crazy when you think about it, but that's that's the rule of life. Well, it, there's there's that there's the theory that it's it's we're trying to make ourselves eternal. It's mm, a little bit of us and them, and so we're trying to keep ourselves alive or our genes or whatever. I. Uh, I that, look, evolution is hard to to explain yeah. because it's kind of something that's happening that we're not thinking about. So, right. like what we want and what our uh, DNA wants to do is like two different things. Right. <laughs> you know, like to your point, our DNA just kind of wants to keep going, you know, right. for as long as possible. Even though for us personally, it probably is not the best decision for us to be making. Yeah, that's yeah, that, that's true. Do you do you mm-hmm. know about that? What about the anti-natalist movement? The the opposite of that. Those are the people that who who, who don't want to be born, right? Yeah, they well, they they don't want anybody to have any children, and the theory is that because you are ensuring that you are increasing suffering, mm-hmm. or this is one of the theories, because that that child will certainly suffer, maybe more than they'll be happy. You're doing a net negative by having a child, and so nobody should have children, and the human race should go extinct or something. There was somebody who was on Sam Harris's podcast, and I think he was talking about. Um, uh, like is life worth living or something right. like to that effect, yep. right? And it was a very interesting conversation because I think he was explaining kind of the the anti natalist movement. And look, to a certain degree, they are right in this respect. The chances that you're gonna have like a wonderful life for most people, look, I don't know how high that, high that is, mm-hmm. uh, especially if you don't live in kind of like you know a society where there's like adequate health care and you know it's not a war torn right. you know civilization, and so. I'm I'm honestly against the movement because I, you uh-huh. can't be out here telling people they can't have kids. I do think though it is a good thing to kind of get people into thinking: Do you really want kids? Like, yeah. or do you want kids because you've been convinced that this is what people do? Mm-hmm. But do you really want them? Can yeah. you provide to them the life that would be the least suffering? Or are you just going to bring them into this chaotic neighborhood where people are dodging bullets all the time? Right. And, and like, like, why would you want to bring a child into the, the world under that condition? So I do think we should kind of be more mindful yeah. as to why we are subjecting people to this 
Right. And it can't just be because you want kids. Like you should you should have something to give to them to bring yep. them in. in in the Western context, right? Now in other countries, look, they don't have access to you know condoms and birth right. control, right. and so you can't really. They have less options. We mm-hmm. have all the options in the world. Yeah. And I don't think we're actually thinking about this stuff. We're just doing these things because our parents did it and their parents did it. So I'm going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. That's true. There, there was an interesting story, though. Um, I, I forgot whether it was like last year, a couple of years ago, where a guy, he, he like sued his mom for having him. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was, it, I think it was I'm pretty right. sure it was Jersey or something. Nice. It was the wildest story I ever met. Because yeah. he was like, My life sucks and I didn't ask to be here. So you brought me into this world without yeah. my consent. Mm-hmm. Which it's is true. wild because it's, right. But you can't ask a baby if they want to be here. Like, right. We all bring children into this world without their consent. It's right. kind of just the, the rules of the game. But um it was the wildest story I ever I ever uh, read. Now obviously his kids got thrown out, but it was just so funny to see Somebody suing their mother because, you know, their life sucked. <laughs> so, I mean, there's like there's there's a weird sense in which he's right, but yeah, but yeah, but no, no judgment. But also, seriously. at a certain point, like if he's an adult, how? At a certain point, your life is your responsibility. If your life sucks, what are you doing? I think you should assume as much responsibility in your life as you can. Yeah, I take that Jordan Peterson approach. Yeah, uh, but I. I do think you can kind of do real damage and put like a lot of extra like life is going to be difficult yep. without bad parents adding more obstacles. And I think a lot of people in this country add a lot of obstacles for their children to have to go through yep. outside of just the natural hurdles that they have to, um, mm-hmm. you know, manage just just to be just, um, you know, becoming an adult. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think probably all parents are bad parents in their own ways. And we all, mm. I, I feel like everybody has their own shit that they've had to work through having to do with their parents. I agree. I agree. But uh, I don't know. <sighs> cool, man. Well, do you want to try playing a little something before we finish yeah, yeah. up? Yeah, let me go get, get my, um, I'm just going to get my uh, my um, keyboard. I'm going to uh, Sweet. Pa- pause the video. Yeah, yeah, no problem. All right. <laughs> Here's one, one of the first, one of the first gobbles on how to learn. Uh... First golf songs I learned on the organ, by the way. You learned that by ear? Yeah. Wow. I mean, those are some thick chords and, <laughs> and yeah. kind of unusual changes, too. They are. It's, it, it, it's, it's got called by um um Byron Cage. Obviously, music's like that though. It's, it's a lot of you know full weird um you know stuff going on in his. Uh, I'm trying to think what else that I could um. We have one um. It's been a while since I. I think it's, it's uh This so called more than anything. Nice. Yeah, that that's a nice one. What, what's what's the pattern there? That's um uh mm-hmm. 
For those who watch, this is exactly why I need to go to music theory because I would be much better at explaining this if I knew <laughs> what, I was, what I was doing. I just know how the song well, here, goes. We, we could do something modal, like, uh, do you know, uh, um. So just kind of sit in, like, D Dorian. So this is the white keys with D. You said D as in dog? Yeah, sorry. Okay. I like this 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 the uh, stuff you treat to me, man. It's, it's uh, I like it a lot. It's a lot, you know. Yeah, this is this would be a, a way better better way for me to uh, create stuff too. By the way, if I knew what oh, was, really? uh, oh yeah, because the way I do now, as far as creating songs, I pretty much like get on the keyboard and then move my hands around until I hear something that sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean that's that's great. <laughs> and then once I have it, I'm like, this is the one. I think I, uh, there's a song from a movie, A Day with an Angel, that I tried so hard to learn. Cause it's one of, it's one of my favorite songs. It was something like, it was something like um. It's a beautiful song. I'm yeah. effing it up, but it's but it's a beautiful <laughs> song. It. I was obsessed. With it. I said I'm gonna learn that song as soon as I'm like older. And I remember like um, two years ago, I remembered that there was the song that I heard in the movie that I saw growing up that I had to learn, and that was the one. Um, I could never find a record online or anything, so I just uh -huh. had to like learn how to play it. I like so I could hear it. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like. <laughs> Beautiful song. That's great. Uh, there's, yeah, there's so many songs from movies that I want to learn how to play because <laughs> it's the only way that I can hear it. Uh, that's one. 
I feel like you sh- play like an organist, I, like the way that your your bass lines and your chords. Yeah, going, that, I can hear it, man. <laughs> it's crazy because that's how. At first, I used to play the bass like a piano player, but I've been playing organ pretty much for the last six, seven years. That when, when I figure myself playing, I I see like an organ in front of me before I see a keyboard now. Right. And so you know, it's kind of like yeah, it's it's. But the only thing is, I'm, I when I want to do like the other stuff, I, want, I like I like to try to transition back to. Okay, how did I used to play mm-hmm. so I could create, you know, more diverse music? But yeah. 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 Cool. Well, that was awesome. I mean, there's this there's, was dope, there's some yeah. stuff in there, man. <laughs> huh? Find find some cool some cool music. It's sort of fun to to kind of like learn each other music. Yeah, yeah. You talk a bit so and play stylish. a bit. And yeah. Mm-hmm. This I was like really them. dope. I, I like I said, thank you for having me, man. I really enjoyed this. Yeah. I, I awesome. probably needed it too, especially you know, just after kind of like, you know, the, the couple of days that I had, you know, this was definitely like a, a much needed, I would say, you know, break from, you know, the real world, quote unquote, <laughs> to like something that I actually enjoy. So thanks. That's great. Man. Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy you did it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy I've come across your podcast. I, I enjoy listening. So everybody so go, much. go, go check out the Black Column and the Cruel Philosopher podcast and yes. find him on Twitter, uh, anywhere else that yeah. you want people at to cru- find you. Yeah. At Cruel Philosopher, uh, no Ian Philosopher though. So, uh, it's not because I can't spell. I couldn't fit all the characters in it. So, <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much. Bye. Oh, Thank you, you so later. much. Bye, everybody. All right. Thanks everybody for listening or watching. Remember to check out Jabaya on the Cruel Philosopher podcast and on the Black Column podcast. And please remember to like, leave a comment, and subscribe to my channels. And if you would like to consider supporting my content generally, please visit my Patreon page. Thank <laughs> you.